Hello and welcome to Executive Decision. Every week we come face to face with business leaders and thought leaders on the state of the Indian economy. Joining me today is Surjit Bhalla, someone who has defended the government through its economic highs and lows, who's been on the Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council and is now on his way to Washington DC after being appointed by the government as Executive Director for India at the IMF. Dr. Bhalla, thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure. And congratulations to you. Thank this is the first time I'm getting to actually see you after that <laughs> big appointment. Mm -hmm. So, congratulations. Thank you. Dr. Bhalla, you will be leaving behind a somewhat troubled Indian economy. So, let me just start by asking you for your assessment on how bad is the state of the Indian economy. Well, <clears throat> look, we have the GDP data, uh, which came out for the second quarter, yes. uh, second calendar quarter, at 5%. Mm. That's bad. And, you know, another aspect of that GDP report that mm. hasn't been highlighted as much uh, in the media right. is that the nominal growth mm. was 8%. Right. And that nominal growth of 8% is about, I think, the sixth lowest since 1996. So there's absolutely no question hmm. that the Indian economy hmm. has slowed down. Okay. And So we are in the middle of a slowdown. We are absolutely in the middle of a slowdown. There's no doubt about it. So right. what we have to ask as analysts, as policymakers, as academics, hmm. what brought about the slowdown? Okay, I'm going to come to that in just a second. Yeah. But what you're saying is, and this is important, that there is no doubt that yeah. we're in a slowdown. Yeah. And all the cuts in growth projections that we've been seeing, whether it's the RBI or the World Bank or the IMF or even, in fact, Moody's, which has been uh, perhaps the most conservative, mm -hmm. has downward revised it to 5.8%. Yeah. You're saying all that is... Correct. Yeah, I mean, that's what the data shows. And I, as you know, I've had a column for a very long time called No Proof Required. That's right. I go by the data. Right. That's so what the data shows. And I have no industry. reason. Sure. And I look at a package of data, as you do, as others do. There's no reason hmm. to doubt that the, the economy has slowed down. Before we move on, do you have at all a number in mind? For? For growth, for GDP, okay. for where, now is, we come, where we're heading? Now we come to an important aspect. You know, and... I just want to point out that uh, the report yes. that we just did. <laughs> this uh, is the high-level advisory Lazi group, group uh, set up by the Commerce Ministry. Commerce Ministry. Which has just come out. Which actually uh, was the least day before yesterday. Uh, there's a team of 12 people who have been working on it hmm. uh, since October of last year. Right. So we have seen okay. the, the slowdown coming. We have seen and analyzed and discussed hmm. the reasons for the slowdown. Right. And we have come up with a set of recommendations. Sure, which I, which we, I had a chance to look at, huh. and we want to get into that. Yeah. But I was just trying to see if I can pin you to a number. I mean, if you don't... Uh, yeah, for the... No, uh, no, I... If you don't want to... Uh, as an too speculative, we don't as, have to. As an economist, I have a number right. for what the GDP growth for this fiscal year would look like. We've what, already had... Uh, one quarter's uh, result. Yes. Uh, the second quarter's uh, result is awaited. Yes. And all the data suggests that, you know, 5%, maybe somewhat less than 5%, and what it's likely to be. Is that your... Is that yeah. Your that, that's my, as an well? economist. It could be 5% to perhaps even below 5%. Below 5%. For this year. For, the, for no... Sorry. That's what I, that yes. is the important point I'm coming to. Yeah. For the second quarter. Ah, for the quarter. second quarter. Now we come for the year. I happen to believe, hmm. okay, by the same analysis, et cetera, hmm. that the second quarter, that is July to September 2019, yes. will be the bottom. Okay. I happen to believe. Second, all the data suggests that, and the policy measures that this government has introduced hmm. suggests that the future, that is the next two quarters, hmm. somewhere around six and a half to seven percent is, in my view, quite likely. You think so? So, yes. So, you think that the next quarter is going to, you're hitting rock bottom what, and you're turning around enough. because of yeah. these measures. Yeah. Let me, let me. Push and there's others. Third point, yeah. and, and this is very important, yes. that there is a belief in the world 
Hmm. Uh, we have the famous inversion of the yield curve in the US, etc. That the world is going into a recession, right. and that will further impact India's fortunes. Right. I am on record on your show today, not talking about India. Mm -hmm. So there is no, if you will, I'm sure, you know, sure, um, whatever, no conflict of interest. Um, but I believe the world will not go into a recession. I think these fears of a world recession are, are overblown. Okay. And I think the world is also reached its bottom. Right. Let me then uh, push back on your suggestion that you're saying that the measures that the government has announced will start bearing results and we'll start seeing a turnaround. Uh, but if you see the latest figures for what is called the core sector that has mm -hmm. just come out for September, mm -hmm. core sector is steel, cement, coal and so on. It is 5%, the lowest in a decade. Yeah. So why are these measures mm -hmm. not having an impact? First of all, as you correctly stated, that this is as of September mm -hmm. and we know the world changed and India changed starting September 20th. So it was well into the finished and the first measure. September 20th you're referring to as? Corporate tax cuts. As the corporate tax, tax cuts. cuts. Right. And nobody I think is claiming mm -hmm. and I don't think uh, government is claiming yes. uh, that that is the sum all and end all of all policy measures that is going to happen. Well, you certainly f suggested it was. You said this was historic. You said this is the biggest announcement since 1991. You said mm. history is being made. No, no, no. You what stand I, by all that? No, what I said, no. Yeah. The, uh, first of all, what I've said, mm. and which I stand by, yeah. that the set of economic reforms yes. introduced since 2014, yes. the cumulative set of economic reforms are bigger than what we had in the previous 25 years, okay. including the 1991 reforms. Okay. So that's the first. I so thought you said, I thought no, you said, I that said this yeah, is no, in no, Indian no, Express, I, I, I think in the Indian Express yes, you said this is a big time reform, equal yeah. if not bigger than 1991 reforms, the making of history. This is specifically about the corporate tax cuts. No, no. Okay. Uh, it was, okay. And if it is, and I don't think I implied there that this was the end. It was the other thing that is said there yes. is that this is the biggest corporate tax cut of any country. Right. Historically. Okay. But that is what I said. Okay. But let's talk about this question of whether at all it is going to be effective because you said it was only announced in September. Yeah. So its measures may take some time to kick in. Mm -hmm. There are some concerns though whether it is actually going to result in kickstarting investment or actually leading to corporates filtering down the benefits to consumers to kickstart yeah. demand, right? Which are, yeah. which are both the expectations. So this is what Credit Suisse, uh, which analyzes firms, came out with a report after the corporate tax cuts and said they studied 77 firms. They said none are likely to raise capex, capital expenditure after the cuts. 90% of the savings of these firms are to be retained or to reduce debt. Mm -hmm. Look, they are in the same forecasting, the Credit Suisse mm. six months ago was saying we were going at 7%. The RBI six months ago we were showing gangbusters. Right. In, in 2018 June, yes. the RBI said they raised rates, hmm. in interest rates because they thought inflation was going gangbusters and they thought growth was going bang, gangbusters. No, but Look, this, is not a, this is not a projection. They seem to be basing this no, no, on their analysis it's a projection. of these firms. If you're saying, of course it's a projection. Okay, you're saying this is a projection. No, no. Huh. I'm not saying. They, it is a projection. That cannot be read as reality. They're saying what will happen. Hmm. How, Basu, how can you read that as reality? They're saying, plain English, okay. this is what we expect will happen. Okay, can I give you then a more specific example? Because every time I get a corporate tycoon on the show, I ask them exactly that question. Mm. I say, are you going to cut prices? Are you going to pass on the benefits of these tax cuts to consumers? Are you going to invest? And almost every one of them tells me, guess what? No. No. Either no, almost directly no, no or and ambiguously no, because it's a little embarrassing to say no. Okay. But the answer almost overwhelmingly is in the negative. Okay. Now let's look at it as economists, as policymakers, sure. as journalists. Um, what determines growth in an economy? Okay. Mm -hmm. And what are the policy levers right. 
that the government has right. to affect output and output growth. Mm. And this is not a new question. This has been done for a. And I would like, after I pause it, yes. your response to it. Okay. Basically, there are two sets of policies you can follow. Right. Monetary easing and fiscal easing. Right. If we now look on your show, I've come and others, yes. and I've been berated that the government has been berated, that they've allowed the fiscal deficit to expand. Mm. Some have said that if you take the off-budget items, sure, sure. etc., that the fiscal deficit, rather than being five consolidated, is, is about seven, seven and a half percent. Right. Okay. Completely agree. Now, so therefore, what you're saying mm. and what your colleagues are saying is that the fiscal policy has been expansionary. No, By I'm, definition. I'm not saying that at all. No, no. I'm, simply, no, no. I'm just, no. I'm, I was actually no, only on, Basu, the, on no, the tax cuts. I'm not, I'm, not yeah. saying, I'm not saying you are saying. Yeah. I am saying that that is what the data is showing. That the fiscal policy, if the fiscal deficit yes. is, and people have said yes. it is expansionary, and people have said yes. that this will lead to inflation. No, but I'm trying to bring you back to the tax cuts and trying to understand you. I'm coming you. to that. Yes. So you don't let me get to, so there were two policy measures and we'll come to the tax cut. Okay. Tax cut is not the only thing. So if we have to analyze, what did I start this interview with? Okay. We have to know the determinants. Right. And then we can come up with a correct policy response. Okay. While fiscal policy has been expansionary, hmm. monetary policy, despite 135 basis point cuts right. have actually inflation has declined by 150 basis points during the same time period. Okay. My so, point being yes, very yes, simply, yes, let me finish, yes. that monetary policy has, no, has been contractionary. Okay. And then on top of that, we timed the slowdown hmm. to 2018, August, September, right. when there was the NBFC crisis. Right. Now, it seems that you, we have to decide whether that's fiscal policy or monetary policy. Right. You decide. Right. But it clearly yes. further dampens activity and further dampens your industrial friends who come on your show yes. and say, we're not going to invest. Okay, the environment the high... is not there for them to invest. Okay, you're saying that the fact that it's not just enough to... I mean, I'm trying to simplify this for yeah. our uh, yeah, um, viewer and let's also have some mercy on them. <laughs> let's not make it too technical. No, no, That absolutely. you're not just saying it's about cutting taxes. You're saying you also have to lower interest rates, which has been yes. one of your uh, you know, uh, issues that you've raised repeatedly. And, and uh, been right on. And, and, and you say you've been right on. Let's you tell me that. why I'm not. <laughs> well, For the viewers, tell me why I've been wrong. Okay. Let me just ask you, though, that if you have a situation where yeah. you're cutting taxes uh, substantially, you've, you've announced a spate of measures, but it's not still stimulating demand, where do you think the gap lies? Okay. And we what, are, can, be, look, what said, can be done to fix it? Okay. As I said, and this report goes into great detail yes. as to what are the set of policy measures needed. And one of the first ones, mm. the first one, it says we need a change in our mindset of policies. Okay? We in India yeah. believe, for example, the yes. set of policies. And these are policies I'll talk about. Yes. If you want tax revenue to go up, yeah. we need to raise taxes. Number one. Second, if we want inflation to come down, mm. we need to raise interest rates. If we want uh, exports to go up, yes. we need to devalue the currency. Now, the point is yes. the world has radically changed. And second, that it has never, ever been the case yes. that uh, certainly not for the last 20 years, mm. I'm not going before that, yeah. that monitor, cutting interest rates affects inflation yes. and or that raising tax rates raises tax revenue. Okay. That's where the mindset needs to change. Point made, but I, I'm still trying to pin you down to something no, which is a little more specific, <laughs> which is to do with stimulating yeah. demand. Now, now, right? now, so here's the thing, that this is the big area of concern, right? The RBI is saying for the first time hmm. that private consumption, which has been the main driver of the Indian economy, is slowing down. So it's not just about the no, top level. Uh, that's what we it's all It's at say. the bottom level. Everyone is saying that. 
Okay, people are pointing to a couple of things which could be behind this. Farm incomes have apparently dropped to an 18-year low. Rural wage growth is the lowest in three years. Achha, how do you, uh, how do you get money? So there's one argument which says, how do you get money into people's hands and get them to spend? Mm -hmm. So one is the sort of Congress prescription of a Nyaya-like scheme where you just do, you know, you just have a, a universal or a quasi-universal basic income. Do you think that's a very completely you misguided think, scheme. You think that's so let's, completely misguided? Let's discuss. I, think I discussed it in your show on NADV for certain. Let's take Nyai. They had the scheme that was announced with much fanfare. Yes. Was that the end result of that scheme was that the poorest at the 20th percentile, like, sure. you know, just to say, somebody at in a in an income range from 0 to 100, somebody yeah. who was at 20, yeah. after the Nyaya scheme, would be getting the same income as somebody at 60. I mean, you can't operate that way. No, no, I'm right? saying leave the design so, of the scheme aside. No, no. I'm saying the idea of having a oh, kind of universal I, basic income as ways of trying to stimulate demand. So there are two ways, yeah. right? Either no, the no, government I, spends no, more, I'll come to that. either you do heavy I'll, spending or you start putting money directly and, in people's hands. Yeah, exactly. So I think Which of those much think? before Nyai, yes. we had something called the PM Kisan scheme. Yes. Okay. And the PM Kisan scheme was exactly what Nyai copied. It said we should give direct benefit transfers right. to those who are needy. In several papers and indeed on your shows, mm. I have said that basically we should replace our PDS scheme and all the rest of it with direct benefit transfers. That's the not PM Kisan. For the, for the, that, that's only for farmers. Yes. I believe it should be for the bottom 50%. Okay. So now, let me now come to what it will stimulate demand. I keep coming back to the fact mm. that, listen, the measure the beginning of policy reform took place on September 20th with a big bang. Okay. But if that is the only thing we have, yes. then I'm afraid. But what that I took at as indicative of, yes. if they can do yes. the largest corporate tax cut in history, right. they are not about, I believe, yes. to stop right there. Okay. Let me ask you this. That's the optimism. Okay. You've been, a, you've been an economic advisor to this government. Do and I was an economic advisor to previous governments to previous as well. governments as well. But talking about this government, do you believe that to the point that we've reached with the economy, that there has been economic mismanagement? Oh, I think, look, uh, there is no country in the world, uh, no economy in the world that has not had economic mismanagement. Otherwise, by definition, everybody would be in Nirvana. Okay, but that's a generalized answer. I'm asking specifically about of this course. government because you, you're not, I, you look, don't hold your, you don't, you don't so pull your punches. If I mean. you are saying, yeah. if you are saying that the economic mismanagement includes both fiscal and monetary policy, absolutely, absolutely. I'm asking How can I deny that? I'm asking even more specifically about something like demonetization. Okay. Well, we can go. We've been through that route, and I think it's a very important route. We've to been take. through that route because no, no, you also, you to, you also changed I'm your answering. position on that. I'm answering. I think I welcome the demonetization measure yes. on November eighth. Yes. I welcome it today, and let's just go into. You welcome it. I welcome it. I, I think it was a very important reform. And when I said yes. that it, the Modi government since 2014 had done more reforms than ever before, cumulative, yes. demonetization was a very important part of the reform. And I think we should discuss this a little bit. But let me just hold, you to, no, let me hold on. Hold on a second. Because initially, when there were a bunch of people who said that demonetization is going to hurt growth, initially you challenged that. Then later you said last year that demonetization did stunt growth by about 0.3 oh. to 0.5 percent on an annual basis, but this stunting was far less than the two percent the critics and the Congress had warned us about. This is your own you assessment. Know, uh, yeah, I, I can't say, Vasu, you have a full-time job, you're very good at it, hmm. and you clearly have not read yes. the various public pieces in the Indian Express that I wrote on demonetization, and let me just remind you and but the I'm viewers. Just, I'm quoting on you. November, yeah. That's one article you're quoting, boss. Okay. One article, November 8th, 2016 was demonetization. Just, yes. I'll quickly wrap it up. Yeah. November 18th, yes. 
in the Indian Express, yes. I, the title of the article is Big Bang or Big Thud. Right. That if demonetization yes. was to be a big bang, okay. then there were certain things would f follow. And if it was to be a big thud, right. this is what would happen. The so which biggest do reason. Do you think the, it's now a big yeah, bang or a big thud? Yeah, it, is, it was a big bang. And I'll tell you, you don't but let is me it finish. now a big thud? <laughs> I said, Baba, yes, a big bang. And I think the present slowdown has nothing, zero, to do with demonetization. So if you let me finish, zero to do with demonetization. Zero to do with demonetization. Absolutely. And let me come to the demonetization measures and the, the history of but that. But hold on, hold on. You, you no, yourself no. have said. You don't let me finish and then. No, no, because no. you're contradicting yourself. Answering, you said demonetization did stunt Ale growth. Baba, okay. Baba. Okay. okay. I have never said demonetization. Okay. In the 0.5%, I wrote into it. That's what I started off this with. You haven't read all my articles and I don't blame you. You're a busy person. No, no, no. But that's not one second. That's one not the point. Yeah. Okay. Basu, okay. one second. Okay. Now we come to the effects of demortization. Okay. At the time it came out, there was estimates from the, the Congress government, from uh, Congress uh, opposition yes. and various others that there would be 5%, 6 percentage point drop. And I think Prime Minister, ex-Prime Minister Manmohan Singh also had a very big estimate. At that time, hmm. and this was a paper presented, hmm. and so this is an academic paper, I will send you a copy of that. Okay. I said my estimate yes. of the impact of demortization, sure. and this would be sometime in 2017, yes. was that it led to 0.5% right. on an annualized basis or 2% two qu two for the quarter. Okay. Now let me finish. Gita Gopinath speak. and the IMF yes. have come out with the same conclusion, and she was a big critic of the demonetization. Demonetization has had growth by two percentage points they, in her latest paper. That is what you not in her very latest paper yes. is two percent for that quarter. On an annualized basis, you divide two by four, you get zero point five percent in her paper. So you're saying that Gita Gopinath's estimate is the same as yours? Absolutely identical. And okay. please give me credit for having come out with this two years ago. Okay, so you're, but you're still saying that that effect, that decision, yeah. has had no impact on the current slowdown. And you all. know what? Gita Gopinath, chief economist at the IMF, who will and be, an who advisor, will be joining. Uh, soon will be joining, an advisor to the Kerala government, right. has come out with exactly the same conclusion in that very same paper. So, okay, even if you were to say that there was a 0.2 or a 0.5% impact that it dented growth, yeah. how was it a reform? What have we achieved what since, you, demonetiz that, since that's, demonetization? And that's the article Big Bang or Big Thud. Okay. Tax evasion. Yes. So, I think the biggest problem yes. plaguing this economy okay. forever, ever okay. is tax evasion. All right. Okay. And let me just give you just very simple statistics. Mm -hmm. And the US, yes. IRS, right. the, probably the most efficient administered economy on taxation, mm -hmm. has that 82%. Since 2006, they posted on the website mm. that since 2006, they've been doing it on an annual basis. Right. And their estimate is 82% of the revenue that the government was to get mm. It, it, it gets only 82% of the revenue that they should get. So 18% is a tax evasion right. in the U.S. How is demonetization I helped Baba, greater tax compliance? Yeah, no, but because I ask you about India, yeah, you're going to so I'm coming to India. In 2002, I wrote a paper in part of the Kelka Committee report, published yes. that the effective revenue collection in yes. India was 15%. Mm. 15 85% was evaded. Okay. That was then updated, and there's another article where they updates saying that post demonetization hmm. is, and pre demonetization, it was something like 24%, and post demonetization is in the mid 30s to late 30s. So, in other words, there has been almost a 14 percentage point jump in tax compliance. Still a very long way to go. 14% jump in tax from compliance. From 24 to 38 let me, let me read out compliance, okay, compliance, compliance. Let me read out this data point to you. Yeah. If you're looking at the growth of tax returns for the entire financial year, it grew 31% in 2012-13, 38% in 13-14, fell to 15% in 14-15, rose to 27% in 15-16, 22% in 16-17, 
and 26% in 1718. So the growth of tax returns was actually higher in some of the years prior to demonetization. It's not, are they, please. Yes. Please, Vasu. Yes. It is the growth of tax returns. Tax compliance mm. has diddly squat to do with tax returns, has to do with revenue collected. Okay. Look at the revenue collected. Okay. How much has that grown relative to... We have. It's called tax buoyancy. Yes. Relative we have looked at how much tax revenue has grown. grown. And I, I and wish that, I had I've the data grown, with me, but I will sit down and I will send the data to you. I if you look at it year on year, the percentage rate of growth has not witnessed any dramatic surge after demonetization. It's I not. Have, uh, oof. Uh, no, Vasu. Oh, so let, but let's do this. No, uh, yeah, yeah, because no, neither no. of us have the... Uh, no, no. Aggreg it's published. Data. Please, viewers. Uh, we've, please we've reported it read. as well. Read. We've reported it as well. Please, okay. viewers, please don't listen to Vasu. Okay. Don't listen to me. Look at what look Vasu at has data. published, look at what I have published and based on official data. Okay. And there you will see that in 2016-17, 2017-18, yes. and 2018-19, yes. there has been very, very solid. And I'll give you a way. Remember, I started off the show by saying nominal income growth. Tax compliance has to do with nominal income growth okay. and tax revenue growth. Right. And in... 2016-17, 2017, 2017 18, yes. that no, uh, nominal incomes were up by about 11% and tax revenue growth was 20%. Okay, let's do this offline because otherwise this we yeah. can go on all day. Yes. I'll, I'll send you my data, you send me your data. No, no, I don't talk. have to send my data. Don't send me data. Just look at articles Fine, published I won't even in send the it public to you. domain. Fair enough. It's in the public domain. If everything is so hunky-dory then after demonetization, yeah. then why are we in this... Yes. Okay. Now, very good question. As I said, hmm. the only tools we have yes. is monetary policy and fiscal policy. Okay. Fiscal policy has been expansionary. Right. Monetary policy, right. the real repo rate in India has been the highest in the world during this time period starting 2016-17. 2016-17, 17-18, 18-19, 19-20. For four years, we have but the real policy. New. I know, you, because you, you keep saying that. Why, if all the if the if if our interest rates were so high, why were we growing at 7% and higher earlier? I mean, this is, again, what? Look, it's a legitimate now, question. Because you, you've gone on about it so many times that it only begs me to ask you. Exactly. So That, that can't be the sole factor, right? I, I said, listen, when you have a policy gap, yes. or when you have, remember, till... First, let me just come to this. Let's take the, the boom years, 2004 to 2011. Mm. I'm just asking you and for the viewers, mm. what do you think the real policy rate in India was? I have no idea. Tell me. Okay. Try minus 2%. Okay. What do you think the real policy rate has been in the last four years? Try 2 plus percent. Okay. That means interest rates right. have gone up by 400 basis points. Okay. Now, 20, so basically... 2014, and this is very important for you to understand, for the viewers to understand. Okay, because 2014-15 yes. and 2015-16 yes. yes. were two consecutive drought years. Right. Okay, which is only the fifth time in Indian history since 1870 that this has happened. The last time this happened was 1965-66 right. and 66-67, which were mega droughts. 2016-17, hmm. we had demonetization, hmm. which is a supply shock. Yes. I admit it, you admit it, everybody admits it. In the, and then 2017-18, you had two mega reforms. Sure. One was GST, hmm. not perfectly implemented, but nobody thought it would be perfectly implemented before it go. And we had the IBC. So four years, you okay, have you're saying supply this is, the, shocks. this is the cumulative impact of a number of shocks. No, and because we're during the time, time period yeah. when supply shocks are coming, uncertainty yes. is huge. Yes. The RBI yes. raises real interest rates. Okay. So now this is the cumulative impact. And then you have the, because of the raise of interest rates, etc., right. and the supply shocks, you have the NBFC crisis, which is dominantly to do with interest rates. Right. In 2018 September. Okay, now let's that's just, when let's the slowdown really started. Let's move forward. Uh, where do you think, and if we cannot just only limit it to interest rates, 
what are the one or two things that the, because clearly as you mentioned that it's not just enough to cut corporate taxes you need to do more personal income taxes personal income tax okay so yeah. you're saying cut personal income tax? taxes i think there are for example long in terms of fiscal policy yeah. there's long term capital gains tax which i think cap criticized maybe on your show as well uh, that needs to go. There is lots of rumors, etc., yeah. about the double dividend tax, which started in 1997. Right. So, inherited, etc., which has no logic. That needs to go. Okay. I think personal income taxes need to be reformed. And I have written in 2017-18, yes. during this time of the government, uh, Arvind Vimani and I argued for a flat personal income tax rate. Okay. Now, Apart from so, that, so that's there... the fiscal policy. So you ask, if I say monetary policy, you say, what about fiscal policy? And I've given you fiscal policy, beginning of the measures. Okay. Let okay. me ask you this. And one second, last yeah. two measures. Yeah. In agriculture, yes. okay, we need to completely free up agriculture. Sure. And use DBT to compensate farmers for the loss in income. Okay. Now, last, did you know, and I hope the viewers are listening, uh, watching hmm. still, that our financial sector exports, yes. because of our regulatory policies, yes. in 2018-19, in absolute dollar terms, hmm. were lower than our agricultural exports in 1980, right. when we were poor, food-dependent nation. So, if you reform these sectors, and we need to ask, your show needs to ask, why do we have, why do we strangle right. the financial sector? Your friends all escape to, and my friends all escape to Singapore <laughs> Which or whatever, my friends have escaped? and all, all escape because we strangulate. Okay, let me ask, the, ask you this. Quite apart from quite apart entrepreneurship, from, we strangulate. Okay, quite apart from specific that's what policy this, measures. That's what this report points out. Okay, do apart not from, strangulate. Okay, apart from policy measures, do you also think that there's something about the culture of governance of this government that needs to change. Abhijit Banerjee, who won the Nobel recently for the economics, amongst the reasons that he cited that is hurting the economy, he said is that the Prime Minister's office runs as a highly centralized bureaucracy and that has led to a kind of paralysis in decision making down the line because yeah. there's a climate now, of fear. Okay. Now, when did the real slowdown in the Indian economy take place? Policy paralysis, that you say, was 2011-12. And that was much before Prime Minister Modi was on the scene. And we discussed this, your show course, discussed yes, it, etc. Yeah. So, so that happened starting then. Yeah. There is a complete, and the whole banking crisis, NPAs, which yeah. I'm surprised you haven't brought up, yeah. were started, were not done in this administration, were inherited. And then the RBI further strangulated it by raising interest rates, so they made sure that the NPAs won't decline. No, but so, I'm asking you specifically about his allegation that decision making is highly centralized, okay. and you that know, has led to again Vasu, a kind of paralysis of yeah. decision making. Because you work one within I, I the system. Do, you, do you agree or not? One, I disagree completely. And okay. I'll give me a minute. I, the, all the arguments I've heard, why India is growing slowly and China grew so well and Korea grew so well and everybody else in the world grew so well, right. they were centralized decision making. Right. So I cannot use that argument when there are tons of arguments. I don't belong, I don't believe we should have a communist dictatorship, okay, etc. Then, so I don't think you okay, can so take centralized. Fair enough. You, you disagree. The absolute and does he mention anything? I mean, in, uh, he also said last to his to credit or blame yes. that we should raise tax rates yes. in order for the economy to grow. Right. I'm sorry. Okay. I don't agree with that either. Either. The absolute last question to you, Raghuram Rajan said that one of the other things that is hurting India is majoritarianism. That that's also becoming a factor in hurting growth? I don't know what he meant or means by majoritarianism. I look at policies okay. and how they affect. If, but you, you, also, if you recall. But you are also very you, much a figure of the public conversation. So you're seeing see, what's happening around us. Yeah. So I think, look, policies determine growth. Policies determine whether you are free or whether you're not free. Okay. So just look at policy actions. If you're looking at economic policies, hmm. as I've stated continuously in this show, we have to identify 
mistakes and I've tried to identify mistakes. Okay. So and you think we rising concerns over rising social unrest, okay. greater divisiveness, polarization, okay. all of Look, that you think doesn't I, have any and, kind of and economic consequence? You know, as, I, as, as I keep coming back to no proof required, which is going to end <laughs> because I'm leaving, I had a book out which I discussed on one of your shows called right. Citizen Raj and which looks at Indian democracy right. from 1952 to 2019, okay. which incidentally forecast that uh, Modi would win by 275 seats. Uh, and this was written in February, March, uh, January, February, when everybody was thinking it was a hung parliament. But never mind. In there, yes. there's a very detailed discussion right. about majoritarianism as you would define it. I don't know how. Uh, Raghuram Rajan has defined it, yes. and the problems, the so social problems, in particular on vis-a-vis -vis cows, uh, vis -a -vis, you know, and Savarkar was a big proponent. No, no, I mean, to the, for the benefit of those who may not have read all of that, I'm just asking you so a simple question. Has I, majoritarianism, in your view, worsened in the past five years, and is that also okay. having and an impact that is why, on That is why I brought the growth. On, that on is why yeah. I brought the book out, yeah. that if you were to look at the and a common index, and this is discussed in detail, yes. is riots and lynchings and so on and so forth. Yes. And all the publicly available data now done by international organizations right. suggests that the incidence of Hindu Muslim communal incidents right. and other incidents has actually gone down in the last five years. Now, it also that's what the data shows and it's not my data, it's from Sweden somewhere and from somewhere okay. because everybody has got the web, they've all this and it's all documented, it's there. Right. Now it is clearly the case that the reporting of data, which I think is very, very good, of extreme incidents is highlighted manifold. Mm. I think there's a particular bias in there in terms of that they don't highlight all such incidents, but never mind. I think that's what a free press is there for. Right. It's highlighted. You asked an aggregate question. Has, in, on average, things become worse vis-a-vis -vis this and the data is suggest no. no. Majoritarianism is not just defined by actual it incidents defined. of violence, right? No. It can be defined, defined in multiple ways. It can be defined by speech, by hate speech, for example, by things and that lead know, us I would, in positions of par se. I, I mean, look, that's one way of I've defining I've heard it. of hate speech. I've been here since 1996. A lot of incidents. And I think as analysts, we seriously, clearly, this is more in the media and absolutely as it should be. We need to ask, and this was done sure. in all countries, etc. when reporting goes up, yes. it doesn't necessarily mean that the incidents have gone up. So hate you speech is something that we've actually counted, and it has yeah. gone up. Yeah. It's gone up by almost 700% compared I, to the I, five years of the I, UPA, five years of the Modi government, it's shot I, up by I, 700%. And on that, we can have a discussion, but I think on the riots, etc., on communal incidents, people cited the same set of figures, right. and that is why I referred to my book, Citizen Raj. Okay. For any objective analysis, it's there. One other interesting thing in the analysis of the data yes. is just Wishy. prior to elections, hmm. okay, and this is historical, yes. the party in opposition yes. has an incentive to increase communal incidents. Right. Okay? And what we find in states approaching state elections, sure. it jumps up, then it goes down. Okay. And it's not so in the overall, interest sure. of the ruling party, whether it was, and this was done by Ashutosh Vashne, right. and as well as by Steve, uh, I forget his colleague's name, they then diverged because they reached okay. different conclusions. But, and that was ended in 1995. Okay, so you're saying that overall though you believe that that's not something that has witnessed a jump, and you don't want to, you don't necessarily think it's correct to correlate it to the economy. The economy, yeah. Okay. There's no evidence, well, we'll have you haven't shown. If somebody shows me the evidence, you'll accept show it. Me. Yeah. Dr. Bhalla, we're out of time, but it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us on Executive Decision. Thanks very My much. My pleasure. Thank you.